if you're here to hear about evasions, you're in the right place. If you're here to hear about APT or uh, the target breach or the Lockheed kill chain, um, I, w I won't be talking about any of that. <clears throat> so who am I? Uh, that's my pseudonym. Um, I'll take a second to talk about that only because a lot of people have asked about it. Uh, Don Quixote, if you've ever read uh, Man of La Mancha, was a guy who was a little bit nuts and, uh, and fought um, unwinnable battles. Uh, and that's primarily what I do. Um, except uh, especially the unwinnable battles part. Uh, you can uh, reach me uh, on Twitter at omenscan or omenscan at gmail.com. Feel free to tell me I'm an idiot or, uh, or tell me you enjoyed this talk or, or uh, you like caramel, I, you know, whatever. Uh, drop me an email. Um, I created a... Uh, uh, intrusion detection and monitoring tool called Omens. Um, that came out of, I was, uh, oh my gosh, I'm going to mention it. I was, t I was uh, chasing nation state actors um, when I worked at NASA. And uh, I saw some things that I thought could be done a little better, so I wrote a program to do that. It's a free program. You can download it at my website, uh, which isn't up there. Uh, but send me a tweet. Uh, it's musictech.com. Uh, and then when I, after I wrote Omens, I decided that I really needed a honeypot to gather more signatures. So I wrote Omens app, which is a honeypot. That's also free. Uh, you're welcome to download those and, and play with them. Uh, right now I'm doing incident response at Live Nation. I like to call them the coolest company on the planet. I really like working for them a lot. It's a great company, great, great management, great leadership. Um, but prior to that, I worked, uh, that's backwards. Prior to that, I worked 16 years at NASA, architecting and defending high-value targets. I did firewalls, IDS, web filtering, vulnerability management, wrote security plans, uh, did incident response. And then prior to that, I worked seven years at Lockheed. <clears throat> so this is my standard disclaimer. Um, I don't speak for anybody, past, present, future employers, assuming there will be future employers after I give this talk. Um, I don't speak for their customers, their clients, nobody endorsed this talk. Uh, these are my opinions. At the end of this talk, they may change. Um, so all bets are off. Um, we're going to talk about evasions. I'm going to talk about evasions. Uh, an evasion for the purpose of this talk is a method of delivering a hostile payload uh, by making it appear benign. It's not exactly what I'm trying to say. Really, probably the definition should be a method of delivering a hostile payload by making it not look hostile. Um, <clears throat> that's because we still live largely in a default allow world. Um, firewalls have it down now. Um, everybody's doing default deny. That wasn't always the case when I first got uh, involved with computer security. But um, we're still doing default allow for a lot of other kinds of traffic, email, web traffic. Um, so all you have to do is make the hostile payload not look hostile. Uh, and you do that by, by bypassing the, uh, the detection systems. So before we talk about the technology, um, let, let's kind of get an idea of the concept of an evasion. So, if you coded a system that would look for the phrase, can you read this, um, it would miss this, it would miss this statement, uh, can you read this, because it's misspelled. Uh, and there are countless ways to mis misspell this statement. So uh, any intrusion detection system that is looking for specific information uh, would, not, would not be able to, to detect this, this statement. Now, we understand it uh, because uh, I'm an endpoint uh, and you're an endpoint, and we understand context. So we understand that a word can be misspelled, and we still understand what that, what that can mean. Uh, computer systems, not so good at understanding context. So we can do some really crazy things. Um, bar, less than, A, N, E, backslash, forward slash, backslash, forward slash, misspell read, th1s. Um, 
A computer system won't understand the context of this. <clears throat> um, so just to validate my theory about this, I decided to run this exact statement through what I think is the most sophisticated and uh, modern uh, context engine uh, for understanding statements, and that would be uh, Google. So I typed this in in Google, and this is what I got. Google had no idea what I was talking about. We do this in all sorts of ways, right? Um, we Vanity license plates can build entire ideas. Uh, this is one of my favorite, favorite. There are some that I've seen that are not appropriate for this group. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, people get really crazy with their, with their vanity license plates. But uh, be creative, right? Uh, so uh, unlikely that a computer system would understand that. Uh, we see that also in uh, CAPTCHA. So every one of you have probably run into this, um, trying to defeat a computer system. Uh, this is an evasion. Uh, we're trying to defeat a computer system uh, from from accessing uh, by, by understanding the, the context of this. So I'm going to hang out mostly uh, at layer six on this. Um, there's really two types of, of evasions that I've run into um, at, at layer six. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about firewall evasions. This is mostly web-based uh, web concepts. Uh, encryption and obfuscation. Um, encryption you typically see in binary, uh, binary situations, malware. Um, the web is primarily text. I mean, we think of the web as being, you know, pretty pictures and, and interactive. But when you look behind it, um, it's primarily uh, HTML on the front end. And uh, on the back end, you're using scripting, which is, uh, which is both text-based. It also turns out that encryption is more trouble than it's worth uh, when you're trying to when you're trying to evade detection. Uh, obfuscation is fine; works works really well. Um, obfuscation can be native. Uh, this is kind of an epiphany I had that you don't have to actually a lot of obfuscation you don't actually have to create. It's already built into the system. All you have to do is take advantage of it. Uh, obfuscation is equally effective uh, as encryption. Uh, and uh, like I said, we're going we're gonna to hang out mostly at layer six. So I've kind of grouped this into two categories, uh, wh what I call native evasions and what I call contrived evasions. So native evasions, again, getting back to this concept of evasions, uh, my, my, my mom and, and her parents, uh, my grandparents on my mom's side, uh, are from Poland. My dad and his parents are from uh, Italy. And when they came to this country, they spoke only English. Uh, it was a time when, you know, they, they left their countries behind and they spoke only English. Except at Christmas time. And, uh, you know, I never did understand if they were planning, uh, you know, my demise or if they were trying to hide which Christmas presents they were going to buy for me. So this is a form of native evasion. This was their native tongue on my, on my mom's side. Uh, Polish and my dad's side Italian, uh, and you could think of them as endpoints. Um, you could think of any person that spoke Italian as an endpoint would be able to understand what they what they were speaking about. But myself, as a monitoring system, trying to figure out what they talked about, uh, I was unable to determine what they were talking about. But to them, it was native. There was no they didn't need to encode anything. So. As we look at native evasions for computer systems, we're all familiar with uh, the standard uh, URL string, right? <clears throat> we're going to talk mostly about the web here. Um, the domain name, the script that you're going to run, and then the, pass or the uh, parameter you're going to pass to it. So the first thing you're going to see is when you look at the back end, uh, what's received. Uh, this is done automatically. You don't type the percent %20 in. It's part of the HTML spec, or the HTTP spec. Any character considered unsafe by the HTTP spec will be converted to this percent encoding. So instead of a space, 
we're, uh, it, the system is going to automatically enter uh, percent 20 in it. So here's an attack. Uh, many of you may have seen this remote file include common PHP attack, right? So if we build a monitoring system to detect this, uh, fairly easy, or even if we look at the traffic on the wire, it's fairly easy to detect uh, what's happening here. But natively, we can send this same string to the back end, and it will see it as that. Nothing needs to be done. It's just that what you're doing is, in the middle, you're creating an evasion that, an, that someone at an endpoint, a user at a web browser, would never type in. And that's because in the HTTP spec, not only can you encode uh, unsafe characters, you can encode any character. And the back end will, will detect it. So let's say we build a detection system and we're going to say, okay, we're going to look for signatures and we're going to, we're going to look for these, these hostile signatures and we're going to decode uh, any percent encoding. Well, then you have more native evasions. Uh, this is Unicode. Your back end will also understand this. A person looking on the wire will have no idea what this means. So let's look at another attack, SQL injection. <clears throat> Not only are there, is there percent encoding, but there are also some special characters that are substituted in a web browser when someone types in an unsafe character. Uh, in this case, spaces uh, are substituted with a, with a plus sign. So when you look on the back end, when you receive the input from the, from the, from the browser or from a hostile actor, uh, that plus sign will be actually converted to a space. The other thing you can do is uh, insert, uh, this is a real interesting one. This one I actually saw on my server. Uh, this is verbatim, except for the blue part. Uh, not only can you insert comments inside of a URL string, and they're ignored. This is native. You don't you don't have to do anything on the back end. You can insert comments. But you see that, that exclamation point, that bang? That is, it took me a long time to find that because there isn't a lot of information on that. That is a, uh, oh my gosh, the word eludes me now. It's a, a, a way to break up, uh, break up URLs. So this actually will, uh, this, this comment will, or this, this URL will be uh, interpreted by the back end. It will ignore the comments, and where it sees the exclamation point, it will, it will break that out as, uh, as, as part, of the, uh, part of the string. And it's that, the term is going to come to me in a minute, but I, I can't remember it right now. Uh, fragment. It's fragmenting. And again, you know, the interesting thing about this is you don't have to actually code this on the back end. Your script will understand this. Even though your detection system uh, probably will not. And <clears throat> again, this is, this is an issue of context. So this is why we see, we're starting to see a lot more sandboxing. Um, because we're coming to the conclusion that a monitoring system in the middle often can't understand what's really going to happen on the back end. So a lot of, a lot of new systems are actually taking, uh, taking the data, uh, detonating it in a VM and seeing what it does. We see that especially with a lot of um, um, malware monitoring systems. The other thing you're going to see that's native is uh, white space evasions. So white space are characters that we see on the wire or that our detection system will see, but for all intents and purposes, the back end completely ignores things like comments, tabs, multiple spaces. 
So these are the kinds of things that you'll see um, either an evasion on the wire or you may see the, an evasion actually in a file. If someone uploads a, a hostile file onto, onto your server, <clears throat> you may see some of these, some of these things included. Uh, the comment crew uh, sort of became famous uh, as uh, using, uh, they were using comments, that's why they were called the comment crew. Uh, and I'm not gonna say the name that everyone else calls them by. But we, we knew them as the common crew, um, and uh, they became famous for putting command and control commands uh, inside comments, inside standard web pages. So to avoid detection, you'll see some of these things, the plus sign, percent 20. Uh, you may see multiple spaces, multiple tabs, quotation marks. Uh, people don't often think of this, but quotation marks, even though we see them, uh, they're not really interpreted, they're interpreted by the program on the back end, but they're largely ignored. They're only there to say this is a delimiter, but the data you really want is in between these. Uh, the, the quotation marks themselves are not considered part of the data. Uh, you'll see comments, uh, just as we saw on the last slide. Um, carriage return line feed. Uh, for, for most uh, purposes, uh, many uh, systems will ignore carriage return line feed, uh, but bad guys can use that as an evasion technique. <clears throat> Hex 0D, 0A. Um, continuation characters, another interesting evasion. Just keep continuing more over and over on the same line. The program, uh, the interpreter, uh, if it's a script, the script interpreter will just basically ignore these characters. And so if you use them uh, in either, you either, either use them on the wire or you use them in a file, um, they're going to be much harder to detect. Uh, concatenation, I, I need a whole day to talk about that. But, but essentially, you can break up the attack into multiple, multiple segments, fragments, then concatenate them on the back end and send them through the system. And there are just countless ways to concatenate data. So to summarize, native evasions are, uh, they're automatic in coding and decoding and they're native to the system itself. Nobody has to write an encryption program or write an obfuscation program. It exists in the system. They're invisible and unknown by the, by the expected endpoints. So the endpoints just consider them what they're going to be converted to. Um, and the exploitation, is, again, is in the middle. It's in understanding that this, this system on the back end expects to see text that it thinks is coming from a browser, but I'm gonna create an evasion that's gonna look like standard browser, something, something someone would en enter in a browser, but I'm, gonna, I'm going to manipulate that in a way that the detection system will not understand it. The second kind of evasion that, that I run into uh, very often is uh, what I'll call contrived evasions. Uh, if someone else has coined these terms, I apologize. They just seemed like good terms to me. <clears throat> so a contrived evasion is something that you are gonna create. Um, the best way to think of this is I'm gonna encrypt my email. I'm gonna encrypt uh, a file. Uh, I need a special program to process that data in a way that cannot be detected. The, the endpoint on the other end is going to need a special program to decrypt that data. It's not native to the system. It's something created outside the system. So to, to walk you know, through this, uh, we'll use again, you know, your standard kind of URL. We have uh, a domain, a script that's gonna be run, and then we're gonna say X equals, and it's gonna be a happy command that our backend expects to see. Well, if we can get a, a, a program onto the server, uh, this is the, the second uh, the second part right here. If we can get a program onto the server that will 
take data that we want to process in our own way. This is a web shell, by the way. <clears throat> it could be any program, but most often I see them as web shells because uh, web shells are actually extremely uh, useful and uh, and uh, and uh, popular tools for for bad guys. If I can uh, fool the system and and upload a web shell, I can then use this, the standard URL uh, that a detection system may expect to see. Uh, domain, script, and then a parameter. In this case, uh, all this web shell does is get the X parameter and execute it. Uh, by the way, I'm going to be using mostly PHP examples, but uh, I've seen web shells in every scripting language. I've seen them in Java, ColdFusion, ASP, uh, PHP, uh, and uh, actually, <laughs> I had someone send me a web shell that got uploaded to a mainframe. It was written in Rex. Uh, so um, these are these are all over all over the place, written in 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 every scripting language you can imagine. Um, so what what are we going to send to this? Uh, we're going to send command slash c netstat ano, and then uh, the output will be piped back to us. Uh, what the web shell is going to do is simply get that parameter and run it. And again, we see uh, our percent twenty there, which in this case really isn't an evasion, but um, I do want to highlight <clears throat> that this is what a typical detection system will look for. Uh, web shell on the back, easy to understand, shell exec, bad thing. Uh, <coughs> netstat dash ano, bad thing. Uh, command slash c, bad thing. Detect, warn, block, all sorts of good things. Okay, so what if we encode the parameter on the wire, right? Base64. Uh, I'm unaware of any scripting language that does not understand Base64. I've seen Base64 encoding and decoding in every scripting language, so it's a favorite among bad guys. Uh, in some ways, I guess you could even say that this might border native because uh, every scripting backend is going to understand <clears throat> Base64. So all we do is take our web shell and modify it a little bit. And before we execute the X parameter, when we get it, we decode it. Now when we see that Base64 string coming across the wire, uh, unless the, the detection system is looking for base64, this is what I was talking about. It does not, it's not benign, but the system assumes it's benign because it can't understand it, therefore it must be okay. Oh, but let's go back here. But still we're able to detect on our back end um, the shell exec command. So we still may know that, uh, that something bad is, is, has been uploaded to our back end. So what if we do the same thing on the back end? We actually encode the script itself in base64. So now, when you're looking on the back end for shell exec, you're not going to see it. What our back end script does is it base64 decodes its own self and then evals it. It runs it, which then takes the base64 input, decodes the base64 input, and runs it. Now, we could say, well, why don't we just always look for base64 and decode it and see if it's hostile? Well, the problem is base64 can be munged uh, in, in literally endless ways. 
Uh, this is one I've seen also. What we're doing here is we're going to reverse this string, str rev. We're going to reverse the string. Then we're going to base64 decode it. And then we're going to run it. It's literally endless. You can inject characters. You can use a substitution cipher. I've seen lots of different kinds of substitution ciphers. Uh, really interesting one. Uh, yeah, I have enough time to talk about it. Really interesting one I saw <clears throat> was where the bad guy found, looked for characters that don't occur. In this case, it was the string 1 and 2. Didn't occur anywhere in the input. And substituted it with another character that never occurred. In, in this case, the, the, the character was a 9. So all occurrences of 1 and 2 were replaced by a 9. There's just no way to build a detection system to, to, to decode that. Uh, I had to do it manually. Uh, and I see it all the time. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun to do uh, to, to get these, these, uh, these, these web shells and, and try and figure out actually how they've been munged. Um, <clears throat> string reversing, I've seen them compressed. So the data is compressed, then base64 encoded. Base64 encoding, by the way, a lot of th people think that it's uh, primarily used because uh, of the obfuscation benefit of it. Turns out uh, from most of, the, most of the early use of Base64 that I saw by nation state actors was the really great thing about Base64 is when you send it, it's never converted because it's always alphanumeric, always. So the web system will never convert it to percent encoding. So you can zip something and base64 encode it, gzip it, mostly I see gzipping, gzip it and base64 encode it, send it as a string of alphanumeric characters. On the back end, the system base64 decodes it, okay, now it's binary again, and then unzips it. So in this way, you can send any binary to a, to a back end system. Um, I've seen string replace, uh, same thing as substitution ciphers. Uh, ROT13, which gets a lot of bad press because it's very pedestrian, but I see it used all the time. Um, and then uh, concatenation, which I talked about, and then this one, uh, which I'm going to talk a little bit about in a minute, which is really, really interesting. Bitwise operators, exclusive OR, anding. Computer systems understand essentially one thing, math. They understand numbers. We, we convert those numbers into characters because that's what we understand. But the systems themselves understand a character as an ASCII number. So if you can exclusive or that character, then exclusive or it you know, again, to, 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 to decode it, you can actually send uh, completely uh, undecipherable information. And I'm going to show that in a minute, uh, something that uh, I've seen and that <laughs> actually works. Uh, <clears throat> so contrived evasions um, are not just on a server. Uh, we see this, we're starting to see it a lot in uh, exploit packs. Uh, but you'll see it in, in malware, where it used to be, you know, the thing you were looking for a lot of times was uh, encrypted, an encrypted payload. Um, now bad guys are figuring out there's lots of ways to obfuscate JavaScript and uh, use that as a hostile payload. So I've seen it in these following Trojans. Uh, these, are, these are Trojans that I, I personally have run into. Um, there are probably lots more, but I know these exist. Uh, particularly the exploit packs, Infinity and Black Hole. Um, and you can deliver these payloads by putting them in PDF files, because PDF 
you can, you can uh, embed JavaScript inside of a PDF file. Actually, you could put them in almost anything, but uh, that's another long talk. <clears throat> so this guy, what? What is that? This is a, uh, this is a web shell that will receive a command and execute it on your server. This is the key. There are all the bitwise operators. This web shell builds a string called uh, dollar underscore. It loads all of this into the string and then it bitwise converts it. There are no alphanumeric characters in this, in this, in this web shell. And, and this does actually work. It took me a long time to uh, partially decode that. I'm not, I'm not through it yet. So what makes that work? Uh, this is what we talked about concatenation. This is taking strings, bitwise converting them, and then sticking them together to create a, uh, a string that uh, exists in dollar underscore. It builds it and then runs it. So how do we detect those things? Well, bad news is some things just can't be detected. That's why we need us. I still get things that uh, are new to me <clears throat> and I uh, have to go to my friend Google and see if anyone has seen them. But the things that you can look for, unusual uses of encoding. So this percent encoding that we talked about a little bit, there isn't any good reason to percent encode alphanumeric characters. Percent encoding is used for what the HTTP spec considers to be dangerous characters, characters that might, might make your system fail because it thinks there's something else. Um, if you see something percent encoded that's alphanumeric, uh, there's a very, very good chance that it is, it's a hostile uh, hostile attack. If you see uh, Unicode, percent U encoding, with a zero, zero in front of it, uh, that, that's Unicode for English. Um, I don't know, does anybody need Unicode for English? Uh, maybe they do, uh, but whenever I see percent U, zero, zero, that, that's a clear flag to me that, that something funny is going on. <clears throat> so base 64, we talked about that a little bit. Problem with base 64 is that it can be munged in uh, countless ways. So uh, the detection engine that I wrote um, that's in, the, 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 in Omens, in the detection system, um, the detection uh, and monitoring system I wrote, uh, doesn't look for base 64. It looks for base 64 patterns. Base 64 always looks like a certain thing. There's a certain distribution of uppercase, lowercase, and numbers. And my detection rates are probably around, I don't know, 80 to 90 percent. Um, turns out it's fairly easy even when base 64 is modified. Uh, especially in a very large string. If you've got a very large program that's been uploaded to your web server, uh, there's a good chance that you're going to see a distribution of upper and lower case and numbers uh, together. <clears throat> so uh, that's, that's how I created the detection, a uh, part of the detection engine in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the monitoring system I wrote. Uh, one of the other things that, that the monitoring system I wrote looks for, and that is, is good if you're, if you're trying to detect hostile uh, payloads or, or hostile data <clears throat> on your server. Unusual use of white space. Um, so tabs and spaces, especially if there are multiple tabs and multiple spaces, 
Um, there isn't really a good reason inside of a script to have 10 tabs and 50 spaces. No programmer really does that. I mean, maybe, maybe one does. I, I don't know of any. Um, but it's a, it's a fairly good way to detect that someone is trying to evade detection. Comments in odd places. Uh, when you look at a program, comments usually are in the place where you expect them to see, right? This section does this. Uh, if you see weird comments in weird places or multiple comments string, strung together, uh, probably a good sign that, uh, that something hostile is, is, is uh, trying to be evaded. Continuation and concatenation, again, very, very large subjects, very, very difficult to detect um, because it can be done in countless ways. So <clears throat> this, is, this slide's kind of standing on its own. Um, I wanted to mention this even though it's not exactly part of all the pieces that I've talked about. But it's important in a detection system to understand context. So the plus sign, um, and there are many others, but plus is probably my favorite. Um, in loosely typed languages, is this addition? Are we adding two numbers together? Are we concatenating two strings together? Is it an HTML encoded space? Or is it a continuation character? I believe uh, plus is continuation for Java. So it's important in a detection system to understand where the data is coming from and where it's going to try and build some sort of context. If a person is trying to evade, where do they think this data eventually is going to go? And how do they think this data is eventually going to be decoded? And it's a really, it's a really hard problem. Um, if someone has this figured out, please talk with me because that will be one of the things I will change my mind about. <clears throat> right now, it's uh, just, just an extremely hard problem. So where, where do we look? Um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of really great movement in, in this area, uh, especially log detection. Log, is, log, detection, uh, log monitoring has always been one of my favorite things. Uh, and that's primarily, I do incident response. I've done incident response for a long time. <clears throat> and when you have an intrusion uh, or you have an incident, really, of any sort, even if it's not an intrusion, the first place you're going to want, want to go is what logs are on this system. The logs really tell the story. And it was always kind of amazing to me that people would collect all of these logs and they would really just use them further on in the intrusion process or the intrusion analysis. Uh, we're going to look at the logs to see what happened. When it turns out, if you're looking at the logs before the intrusion, um, you, you have a very, very often, you have a heads up. Uh, and that's, again, uh, primarily because every, every intrusion I know of, uh, certainly there are insider intrusions which, which won't, won't fall into this category, but any intrusion coming from the outside is always going to be preceded uh, by reconnaissance. There's always going to be reconnaissance on your system. If you're able to detect that reconnaissance uh, in your logs, <clears throat> there's a really good chance that you're going to be able to say, does our system prevent this? Uh, who might this actor be? Uh, and at very least, raise your level of awareness where, OK, we're a target. Somebody's doing recon against us. Uh, we need to be aware that, that this is happening. So if you're not monitoring your logs, uh, this is, by the way, one of the things Omens does. It was one of the reasons why I wrote it because I was running into many intrusions where um, the analysts were looking at logs after the intrusion had already happened. 
and saying, oh, wow, look, this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened. And my question always was, well, if you know after what happened, why couldn't you have known before since the data was already there? <clears throat> um, NIDs and HIDs, uh, again, very good tools. Uh, WAFs, you know, will fall into this, this same category, intrusion detection systems. Um, should be asking your vendors, uh, does, does my network intrusion, detection in, network intrusion detection system or my host intrusion detection system, does it look for evasions? Does it decode base64? Does it understand uh, Unicode? And then the last um, new files. So <clears throat> we all have FIM on our systems, right? We're doing file integrity monitoring. We're getting alerted when files change on our systems. The problem is we know when files change on our systems, but then what do we do? Do we wait until there's a, an intrusion and then go back and say, oh, look, guess what? This guy changed a file on our system two years ago. By the way, that's not unusual. Um, you've seen it all over the news. Everybody reports it. This, uh, you see this average intrusion was two years before detection or 18 months before detection. Uh, I worked on an intrusion. <laughs> I worked on an intrusion that ha had happened uh, about two years before it was detected. And the only reason it was detected was because another actor had been probing that system and found the original intrusion that was left there and, and never used. The web shell was uploaded. Another actor scanned this system, found the web shell, and used it. They didn't have to do anything. That web shell had been uh, sitting on the system for two years. So it's not really good enough to know that files have changed on your system. Uh, this was, again, something that I thought uh, that, that I added into uh, the intrusion monitoring system I wrote <clears throat> was, OK, I know there's a new file. Let's open that up and let's see what's inside of it. Are there evasions in it? Are there known signatures? Uh, is someone doing, it, does it say shell exec in it? OK, so does it have eval in it? Um, if it does, and you go to the programmer and say, did you put this on a system? The most likely answer will be, no, I didn't. But if the answer is, yes, I did, then the second response is, why did you do that? Why did you put eval in your program? This, this should never be uh, in, in, a, in a web system. So oftentimes you'll find as you begin to get, your hand, get a handle on these things, they touch other things. So not only are you interested in whether a bad guy put something on, on your system, you're also interested, did one of the developers use unsafe coding practices? Something that maybe your uh, vulnerability monitoring system didn't detect. Or maybe you're not doing vulnerability monitoring. Uh, so, uh, New files, I can't stress this enough. It's not enough just to know that a file has changed on your system. If files have changed on your system, someone needs to check them, especially if they're in web directories. So thanks for swinging by and uh, listening to me talk. Oh, good, yeah, there it is. Um, my website uh, is on the bottom there. You can send me a tweet or send me an email. Um, <clears throat> I'm always open to being wrong. That's the best way I learn. So if I've said something that uh, you guys know is rather incorrect, uh, please let me know. I have a blog where I talk about all sorts of things that interest me. Uh, but, but, but please uh, send me an email if, uh, if, if you'd like. All right. Thank you to everybody. I want, to present, oh. I want to present you with a certificate of appreciation. Oh, thanks, man. You can hang it up somewhere in your garage. Yeah. And we're making a donation on your behalf to the ISSA Education Foundation. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, do I have time for questions, or you do. am I out? Okay. You do.
So uh, any, any questions? Yes, please. Okay. Sort of a, you know, you've got the two endpoints. Right. And even on Can everybody the, hear, by the way? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Even on the endpoint, like your web server or, or whatever is being attacked. Right. Even at the layer at which you're processing the information. Yes. Uh, that's where the evasion is taking place. Right. As, as you've noted in logs. Right. You may not, you know, that may be obfuscated in logs. Right. So the question sort of becomes, have you seen any or are there any ideas floating around out there about protecting at a, um, a different layer? I mean, obviously, at some point, the computer you know, is going to translate the obfuscated right. code into the real instructions. And exactly, happens. right. So, for, for example, you could do a memory analysis afterwards and know that that happens. Right. Ergo, you like, be able to know that it's happening. It's happening. Yeah. Right. So the, you know, there's a lot there to unpack. Um, so I'm a, yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna step away from it just a second, and and then and then and then talk about specifically what you're saying. But if you think that a system can be developed, or you think a system exists today that can do all this, um, it doesn't. Um, obviously, bad guys are still compromising our web servers, and they're still finding it fairly easy to do that. Um, and even if it existed today it wouldn't last. The fundamental problem is that when you get down all the way on the metal, you find that <coughs> systems are fundamenta fundamentally, pervasively, and systemically vulnerable to attack. We don't build systems that are impervious to attack. If we did, everything would be default deny. You'd need permission to do anything. But we don't build systems like that. We build them largely so that people can come get information. So the answer to your question about at what level should I detect evasions or attacks or anything else, all of them. All of them. If you have detections at layer six, you should have them at five, four, three, two, one. Well, maybe not one, but um, and that is what we used to call the fence in depth. And before that, we called it layered security. But essentially, the idea is if one layer doesn't detect, an, another layer will. Is that okay? The products are largely vertical. Products are largely vertical. And this is, again, a pervasive issue, security issue today. Our security systems don't talk to each other. So this is things like Sticks, Taxi, uh, OIC, or IOC. I can't remember. Uh, but these are some of the protocols that we're trying to build that the, the community is trying to build to say, we would like information to be shared, and we would like it to be horizontal across our security tools. Because right now, your security vendor has intelligence, and they're not sharing it with, with anyone else. Other questions? Well, that was easy. All right, thanks. <laughs>